Now, depending on who you ask, you'll probably receive a slightly different answer as to when or if you should ever raise your ISO. Outside of the obvious situations, of course, like astro and night sky photography, but I consistently encounter two very common situations over and over again that always result in the need to increase my ISO. And I used to look at ISO as a, I guess, a tool or a method that was there just to resolve exposure issues that should only be used as a, a last ditch effort, a final attempt, if you will, in an emergency situation only. Once I've exhausted all other possible measures to resolve my exposure issue, things like adjusting my aperture, adjusting my shutter speed, but when all else fails, then I could lean on ISO if I absolutely had to. And in this video, I wanna share with you the two instances that, that consistently, that I encounter all the time, that I always have to end up bumping up my ISO. Now, before we jump right into it, I want to, to uh, I, I think there's this common misconception when it comes to landscape photography, ISO, and the use of a tripod. I often hear folks discussing how you should never ever need to increase your ISO for outdoor landscape photography if you're shooting on a tripod, because if you encounter any type of exposure issues, since you're not hand-holding your shot, you're on a tripod, you can always just drag out your shutter speed to resolve your exposure issues. And yes, that is an accurate statement, but only a portion of the time. And in, in these two instances here in this video, that just simply just does not apply. Now, something that really helped me to overcome my, I guess my fear or my angst when it, can, when it comes to increasing my ISO above 100, because I think a lot of beginners are, actually I did this for, for many years, I was so conditioned to think that the only way to get a super clean looking photograph was to use ISO 100. And the moment that I increased that from 100 to say 200, that uh, the, the overall image quality is immediately degraded and it just starts to go down is the higher I increase my ISO. And I guess that is true to a certain aspect, but I ended up going through this, uh, this experiment that um, I've done this a couple times and I just did it recently where I took my camera downstairs, my Fuji X-T3, I set it up on a tripod and I actually pointed it at my Christmas tree, which I find to be a fantastic subject for this because there's bright areas adjacent to, uh, to darker areas, which is great to see noise resulting from uh, using your uh, ISO. And I ended up setting up my shot and uh, put it on the tripod so nothing changed at all. The only thing that would change would be my ISO level. And I just took image after image after image, just increasing that ISO because the, and I wanted the, the ultimate goal with this would be to identify exactly where that threshold is. Where's that level that I can take my ISO before I start to see an unacceptable level of noise. And here's the images right here. So as you can see, this is my Christmas tree. This is shot at ISO 160, and this one is shot at ISO 640. And if I zoom all the way into this area right through here, you know, this in theory should be the cleanest image. This is ISO 160, this is ISO 640. As you can see, they look pretty similar. If I go to the next one, this is ISO 1600. I really don't see any additional noise in this image either. This one right here is now ISO 2500. And I'm starting to see just a tiny, tiny bit. But uh, overall, the, in, the entire image is holding together well. The color still looks good. The sharpness still looks good. And then this right here is ISO 5000. And this is where I can start to see noise, uh, uh, quite a bit of noise being introduced. You can see how it's really affecting the colors right through here. You can see that really with this blue strip on this ornament as well. But this ultimately has helped me to identify exactly on my Fuji X-T3 that I know now that I can push the ISO to 2500 and still come away with a very clean looking image. And if I absolutely have to, I can take it to 5000. But 2500 is really that threshold. And we're really zooming into these photographs. I mean, we're really pixel peeping, looking for the actual, uh, the, the noise in these photographs to identify exactly where that threshold is, which obviously we don't look at photo, or most people who aren't photographers don't look at photographs like that. You don't zoom all the way in to see, to, to look for noise. You look at them as, at face value. So I think that's just incredibly fantastic and, and useful information to, to really understand your camera, your tool, as to where you can push that ISO. So I would highly encourage you, if you've never done that exercise before, just take a few minutes. You only have to do it once, and then you'll always know exactly where you can push your ISO. So now as far as the two instances go that I mentioned at the beginning of the video that I always encounter, they're very common situations, and I find that I always, always, always have to increase my ISO in both these situations. 
And the very first one is something that uh, I simply call just moving water. And this is a great example right here. This is from a um, trip to the Blue Ridge Mountains this past fall. And uh, I set up my shot. I picked the aperture that I was looking for. As, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, this is Catawba Falls. And what I did is I, I set up my shot. I think this is uh, F8 or maybe F11. And then I started to experiment with different shutter speeds to try and get the, the amount of detail in this water. I wanted to make sure that I, I showed the motion. I didn't want to freeze the motion in the water. And I also didn't want to drag out my shutter speed to where the water just looked like milk flowing down this waterfall. But uh, this is the ultimate, uh, this is the shutter speed I ended up going with right here. I thought it was a good blend of showing the motion and the detail. But what happens a lot of times, especially for me, is because I shoot a lot of waterfalls and it's probably my favorite subject. And a lot of the waterfalls that I photograph are in woodland areas, in valleys, in the mountains, in, in you know, in like enshrouded in canopies of trees, which ultimately results in not a whole lot of light, especially if you're shooting around a sunrise or sunset. These are dimmer situations. So when I set up this shot, which happens to me all the time, set up the aperture, you pick the shutter speed you want to go for, and then you look at your light meter or your histogram, and you're two to two and a half stops underexposed. So what do you do in this situation? You could change your aperture, but then that's going to completely change how much of your scene is in focus. Or you could change your shutter speed, but then that's going to completely change the overall look of the, uh, the, the movement in the water. And I personally think that when you're photographing moving water, whether it's waterfalls or seascapes, shutter speed is king. It's the most important setting for you because it's going to have the greatest impact on what your overall photograph looks like. So changing the shutter speed in this situation or dragging out that shutter speed to increase the overall exposure is just absolutely not an option. So what do you do? This is where you, you lean on your best friend, which is ISO. And in my mind, I have already gone through my test. I've done this uh, before with my Fuji X-T3 and my X-T4, which is the same sensor anyway, but I now know that I can push my ISO to ISO 2500 and still come away with a very clean looking image. And this one right here, I only had to push it to ISO 640. But if I zoom in here, I'm zoomed in very far, there's, there's no noise at all. If I look in the darker areas, it's a very clean looking photograph. But by increasing my ISO from 160 to 640, I was able to resolve the exposure issue I was encountering. I didn't have to change my aperture and I was still able to keep the shutter speed that I wanted, which was hands down the most important aspect of this image was the shutter speed for this waterfall. So I think photographing moving water is almost always one of those situations where I have to bump up my ISO a little bit. Now, the second situation is something that I simply call woodland wind. And if you photograph any kind of a woodland scenes or any situ anytime you photograph a tree that happens to have a leaf on it, you probably have encountered this before. And this scene right here was a great example. It was a very blustery morning and the, the leaves were obviously kind of blowing around and everything. And I, I picked my aperture that I was looking for to get everything in focus in the scene. I picked the shutter speed that I needed to keep the, uh, the leaves from moving. I wanted to keep the shutter speed fast enough so there wasn't any kind of motion blur in the leaves. But then once again, I look at my light meter or my histogram, two and a half, three stops underexposed. So what do you do again? You don't want to change your aperture. You don't want to change your shutter speed because if you drag out that shutter speed to resolve those exposure issues, you're going to slow down your shutter speed and you're going to get movement in the in the, uh, the leaves and you're going to have blurry leaves all throughout your photograph. And unless, unless that's the look you're going for, which is usually not what I'm going for, I usually want my leaves to be perfectly tack sharp because I want to see all the detail in them this is where you can lean on your ISO once again. And I bumped up my ISO in this situation. I think I ended up using ISO 1600 in this image, but once again, very clean looking photograph, no noise anywhere within this image. But that's once again, just another, another situation that I encounter all the time. And I hear people talk about this situation a lot as well as how do you keep the leaves on your, on the trees perfectly sharp. And a lot of times it's because people are very leery about increasing the ISO. So you just end up just dragging out your shutter speed and that's always going to result in, um, in blurry leaves in your photograph. So whenever there's anything moving in your scene, I would be a little bit more, I guess, apt to lean on ISO a little bit. And like I said, once you go through that experiment with your camera and you know exactly where you can push your ISO, I would definitely start to lean on that a little bit more. And once I started to look at ISO like this, I find now that I use ISO 100 or ISO 160 in my, my Fuji camera way less now than I ever have. I'm almost always around ISO 640. And it's just because I'm comfortable with it. I know I'm going to come away with a clean image and I'm going to be able to use the shutter speed that I ultimately want. I'm not going to have to change my aperture either.
So I do hope that information was helpful. Something a little bit different, a real quick video this week. I know it's the holiday season and everyone probably has something uh, more important to do, spending time with their family, uh, more important things to do than just listening to me ramble on about uh, camera and landscape photography stuff. So I really do appreciate you watching this week's video. If you do have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And if you did enjoy this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video, and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.